I want to make one more point. We're talking about strain. And we're going to define strain mathematically in a second. But from 319, what, like in words, what is strain? Yep, delta L over L. So right, if I have, say I have a bar that has some initial length L, and I pull on it, and it deforms to a new length where this change in length here is delta L. All right? You're saying in 310 you said that strain is delta L over L. Let's call this L0, the original length. Right? So another way we write, write this is the current length. Um, so you know, delta L is the current length minus the original length over L0. Why did we divide by L0? Why not divide by the current length? Well, why not? I mean, we got delta L on top. If I, I could divide by L0 or L, and it's still going to give me a number. It's not 1. Huh? It will be a different number. Uh, L0 is a constant, but it's not that big a deal. Why, why, not, why not divide by the length of that wall over there? Why not divide by the size of your iPhone? Yeah. Turns out it's sort of a trick question. You, you can divide. You can, the, the length, L0, is just a normalization to make it dimensionless, right? Um, and you can divide by whatever length you want, right? So it, by convention, we, we often, when we divide by L0, the, the, the name we give this is engineering strain, okay? Uh, there's other choices, though, right? So we could um, divide by the, the final length, right? Uh, you know, after the experiment's over, that's not as common, but sometimes we call this the Eulerian um, strain. Uh, what another one that's more common is to say that we're we're going to always divide by the instantaneous length at any at any instant in time, right? So at, we're going to say that differentially uh, in the limit, delta L is is dL. And then we're going to divide by L, and we're going to integrate from 0 to LF. Right? And this guy is what we call the true strain. Or sometimes you hear it called the logarithmic strain, the log strain. And the reason, of course, it's the log strain is that when you compute this integral, you, you get a natural log. So. The point is, is that you should always, I mean, the point of me, this little aside, is to say that you should never say strain. It's not specific enough. You need to say engineering strain. Your plots should say engineering strain, or true strain, or logarithmic strain, or whatever strain measure you're using, because it makes a difference, particularly when you have large inelastic deformation. Right? So if we go back to our stress-strain curve, There's the elastic part. For most materials, particularly rocks, the strain at which the elasticity stops, this, you know, this, this strain here, the elastic strain, might be like on the order of Point two percent, point two percent strain. It's not not a lot of strain. And in this elastic range, most none of these strain measures are very different. Like if you actually were to compute the numbers between the true strain and the engineering strain in the elastic range, 
The only difference is going to be in the ninth decimal place. It's not going to matter that much. It's probably less precise than the measurements you would make. Okay, but when you have large inelastic deformations, when you have large inelastic deformations, now there could be a huge difference. So if this is your engineering strain, the logarithmic strain might be like that. And so if I asked you, what's the stress at 10% strain? Right? So let's say this is 10%. If I ask a question, what's the, what's the stress at 10% strain? You better ask me, what strain are you talking about? Because they could be off by 50%. Right? So label your strain, particularly in large deformation problems. When you go and you do your lab reports, I've asked the TA, um, so the, the, the TA is going to grade, do all the grading for the lab, lab. So if you guys have any questions about that stuff, you, you know, take it up with him first before you come to me. You know. um, and just the reason for that is that I just want it to be consistent. I just, you know, uh, it, it, it's easier for me if, even if, I don't think he will, but even if he grades poorly or something, if everything is consistent, it's easy for me to curve it at the end and adjust it that way, right? Um, so he'll be grading them. But what I've asked him to do when it comes to the lab reports themselves is um, what I care about the most is the figures. Right? So, you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't want him to grade on the weight or the length of the thing or how, much, how many pages you write. I mean, obviously, you, you need to write enough to fulfill the objectives and explain the data. But... A well-made figure is worth 10,000 words, right? And so if you make your figures well and spend a lot of time on the figures, uh, then you'll, you'll do well on the lab reports, okay? And, uh, and so again, you better label your strain. If I, see a stre if I see something versus strain and there's not a label there, then I'm going to get upset because I just spent 10 minutes talking about it. Label your strain. It matters. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, if we were to load this thing, if we were to come to here and then and then unload it, all the way to all the way to zero force, right? Then we were to at, um, immediately restart the loading. We would start from here because we've had permanent strain. We would go back up this line elastically until we hit that point, and then we begin to deform plastically again or inelastically. And then if we unload it again, we'd have that. Up until some, at some point, the material will fail. Uh, you know, in a sense, when I when, when I talk about material failure, I'm talking about you know a, a complete loss of cohesion, right? What what was once a nice round cylinder. When you remove the load, is is at a minimum two pieces of something, but it could be much more crud, you know, many many, many pieces. You know. Material separation. Yeah, it, it will, um, for sure. So if, if, you, if you start here and then you unload, I mean, you haven't failed the material at that point. So that's just how strong the material is. So if I unload, it's going to go down to here. And then if I, if I reload, it's, gonna, it's actually going to get be stronger than it was initially. Right? So you won't get, you'll, you, you get sort of extra elasticity when you do it like that. In reality, when you do uh, large deformation samples on rocks, it's real hard to even see the, the, the initial elastic response. Because what happens when you initially load a rock is just like I said, you, you know, there's, there's, um, 
there's a lot of micro cracks and flaws in there, and some of those can be open and other things. And so the first thing you do is you just sort of close up all the flaws uh, and, and possibly slip some of them and other things. And so it's very difficult to ever see the elastic modulus here. You almost never see it right there. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's too small to like fit a straight line to. And so often what you'll see in, in real tests are unload reload cycles. So in a, in a real test, a lot of times you'll see this kind of thing. So if you ever see some data, you'll see the, that kind of thing. It's exactly what they're doing is unload, reload, unload, reload, unload, reload to get the elastic modulus. So then you can come back and you can fit, you can fit straight lines to these guys uh, to get the unload. The last modulus, because it's very difficult to get right there. The elastic part of the curve is so small. No, I, didn't, I mean I didn't draw it well. It, it should always be this roughly the same slope. So 